All right. Uh, let's go ahead and put Psalms 86.9 up. <clears throat> Excuse me on the voice. I've uh, had a little throat issue the last couple days. Uh, a gift that I received during Christmas time. A little, <laughs> a little frog in my throat. Uh, the title of this message... The title of this message is The Journey... <laughs> The journey from resisting God to displaying His glory. That's what we are called to do, to display His glory. The journey from resisting to displaying His glory. And we'll start in uh, verse 9, Passion Translation. It says, Lord Almighty, you are the one who created all the nations. Look at them. They're on their way. Yes, the day will come when they all will worship you and put your glory on display. And so I would like us to just take a uh, very quick international trip together tonight. This is a trip that all of us who are followers of Jesus Christ must take. This is a trip that we're not taking alone, thank goodness. We have our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, and we have each other. God has given us each other for this journey that we are, we are on, an international trip. It's talking about the nations. And this international trip will remind us that all the nations were created by God. And that all of these nations are destined to display the glory of God. We don't always think in those terms, but that's what the word says. And as we can imagine, there are also nations within us. These are not just nations outside of us. They are in us. And for the sake of this teaching, I want us to think of these nations as assumptions, belief systems, or mindsets. I, I talked a couple of months ago about the mindsets that we have the ways we believe, the ways we think about certain things, and those mindsets determine our direction, they determine how we act, they determine how we treat people. And so for the sake of this teaching, the nations that I'm referring to are those mindsets, those beliefs, those assumptions. Mindsets are like nations. They occupy a land that was destined to display God's glory in the earth. And that is you. And that is me. We are destined to display His glory in the earth. That's what the verse says. To put your glory on display. And that is why we were born. That is why we are here right now. People want to know their purpose. They want to know why am I here. We are here to display the glory of God in the earth. Now this section of scripture is interesting in that I believe it shows the very heart of the Father. You see, there are other places where God tells Israel to destroy the nations, to drive out the nations from the land so they can occupy that land. But in this scripture, he's saying the nations will actually glorify me in the earth. You see, in this prophetic verse, he indicates that he wants to save the nations. Could it be that in order to deal with his people, God sometimes conceals the truth for a time until we're ready to hear the truth? Do you know what I'm talking about? There's this growth process. There's this, this interesting dichotomy whereby God deals with us on the level that we're on. And so if we're in a war-like footing, if we are in a war mindset, he's going to kind of let us go down that road a little bit. But what he really wants is a people, as Jesus taught us, that love their enemies. It was never in God's heart to destroy nations. It was in God's heart to save nations. Why would Jesus, who's an expression of the Father, come and say, Listen, I'm not here to overthrow Rome. Why did Jesus not take up arms against the Romans? They were a mess. 
They were against God's people, and yet Jesus, showing us the true heart of the Father, he said that when you see me, you've seen the Father. He says, listen, I'm not here to overthrow the Romans. And then he gives this incredible concept that has never even uttered, been uttered by the lips of anyone on earth when he says, you've heard it said, hate your enemies. I say, love your enemies. This was radical, totally radical that we would love our enemies. And so does God meet us sometimes in our mindsets? Has he met us even in, in the church, in our journey of faith, sometimes met us in our mindsets of legalism? Sure, absolutely. I know he did with me. There were certain things, there were certain times that he allowed me to believe certain things. That wasn't his true heart. He was trying to get me to a point, get me grown up to a point where I could really find out what his true heart is. And his true heart is the love of God. Amen? But he will allow us to go down certain paths so that he can reveal to us his true heart. And his true heart is, is that the nations would glorify his name in the earth. That they would actually be saved. And so, if mindsets, if assumptions, if beliefs are like nations, then I'd like us to look at Psalms 87 because it shows us five nations that need to be dealt with. Again, a mindset is an established set of attitudes or beliefs, beliefs held by someone. And so we're going to see five nations on this international trip that we're on that we need to deal with. Start in verse 1. High upon his hills of holiness stands God's city. How God loves the gates of Zion, his favorite place on earth. So many glorious things have been proclaimed over Zion, God's holy city. city. Pause in his presence, in other words, Selah. I like Selah a little better. For the Lord says... Here are the nations who will acknowledge me as God. Here are the nations who will acknowledge me as God. Number one, Egypt, Iraq, Palestine, the Mediterranean people, even distant Ethiopia. They will all boast, I was born in Zion. I was born in Zion. And so five distinct nations that prophetically here, Psalms 87 is calling out. And it says that these five nations will declare the glory of God and will declare, I was born in Zion. And so the first nation, of course, is Egypt. This is translated in the original language as the proud one, the proud one. Now, scripturally, uh, we understand that Egypt is a type of the world. It's a type of us before salvation. So anytime you see Egypt in the scripture, that's talking about our journey before Christ. And I love the fact that that is specifically translated proud one because it is our pride that tells us we don't need God. And so the first mindset, the first assumption that God is dealing with in this journey that we're on is that I can do this on my own. I can do this. That's Egypt. I can do this on my own. And so whether it's before we were born again, we think we can do life without God, life without bowing our knee, knee to the Savior, or after we're born again, our pride also tells us we can do it on our own. Anybody else heard that? Whatever we're facing as we're on this journey, we are born again, but there's still that, that mindset of Egypt, that proud one who says, you got this. You don't need God for this. You got, you got a sin problem. You got to clean up your life. You got things you got to make right. You got this. Just do it. Just, just make it happen. Anybody ever tried to stop sinning before? How did that work for you? And so this idea that we can do it on our own is a mindset that needs to be dealt with. I'll just go to Proverbs 6.16 6, because it really describes, let's say, Egypt. The Egypt that was in all of us before we were born again. These six things, Proverbs 6.16. 6, 
These six things the Lord hates, yea, seven are an abomination, a proud look, a proud look. Notice how it starts with pride. Pride is the thing that he will never overlook. He resists the proud. A lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among the brethren. And so aren't you glad that we have come out of that place? Amen. He brought us out of that Egypt into a place where we can be free from all of those things. There's nothing in Egypt for us. There's nothing in all of those things that we just read. They certainly don't bring any fruit in our lives. And so again, God sometimes lets us experience these things so that we realize, man, this thing really doesn't satisfy. He, I actually believe God. He's right. Sin only brings death and destruction. It does not satisfy. It never delivers. It's, it never pays off what it has promised. And so Egypt is a land that we have come out of. It's a mindset that once was against God, but now on this journey is going to begin to glorify God. Because instead of thinking, I got this, I can do this on my own, we re now realize who has it, and that's Jesus Christ. We cannot do this on our own. And again, these are mindsets that he sometimes, it takes a while to, for us to get it. How many times do we have to fall and he picks us up again and fall and picks us up before we say, wow, God, you really do love me. You really are right. You really were correct the whole time until we come out of that assumption. All right, the second nation is Iraq. Now, that's the modern name for it, but biblically, it's Babylon. It's the nation of Babylon. It means confusion. More specifically, it means spiritual confusion, a system of confusion, a religious system of confusion. And so the, the mindset number two that I want us to, to understand is that this idea that religion can help me. This idea that the realm of Babylon, Babylon, the Babylonish realm of religion, that can somehow help me in the situation that I find myself in. And again, the situation is I see how much is still uh, seemingly unfinished in me, and I, I want to see growth. I want to see the fruit of the Spirit come forth in my life, and I, I cannot make it happen with my own strength. So we think that religion can help. And so we make this list and we say, okay, here's my New Year's resolution. I'm sure some of us will do that in a week from now. All right, I'm going to make sure I'm at church every single time. I'm going to make sure I read my Bible. And so we create all of these structures that's nothing more than religion. And I love the story of Saul's armor, and we'll go there in 1 Samuel 17, 38. It's a beautiful picture to me of religion. Religion is something you put on. And so this little shepherd boy, his name was David, and all he had ever known was just trust in God, simple faith. That's what faith is, just simple trust. And when he was out there taking care of those sheep and a lion and a bear came along, God took care of him through him. And so that was his entire experience. But then he goes out there and he sees Goliath calling out the people of God. And he said to Saul, listen, I want to go face him. And so Saul, very well-meaning, like many religious people, like a religious system that was birthed out of this nation called Babylon, there was a, let's say, a good intention. We want people to be free from sin. We want people to live right, right? And so we set up all this scaffolding to make it happen. We put on what I call Saul's armor. And so in verse 38, it says, So Saul clothed David with his armor, and he put on a bronze helmet on his head, and he also clothed him with a coat of mail. And David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk. Notice, <laughs> tried to walk. Has anybody ever tried to be a better Christian, to clean up your life? And he said, I have not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I have not tested them. So David took them off. And he took his staff in his hand, and he 
chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in the shepherd's bag in a pouch in which he had, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. So he cast off religion. And, and if there is one thing that is sweeping the modern-day American church, and you can look at it all over YouTube, people are casting off religion because they're realizing it has not produced fruit. And so people are looking for relationship. They're getting a lot simpler. Jesus Christ, a relationship with him and with his body. And so we're in a, a very wonderful time because you can see the simplicity of this too. He had this whole set of armor that he cast off and now all he had to have was the five stones and, and a little sling. And of course, five is an amazing number scripturally because that has to do with grace. Five is the number of grace. And so if you think about it, when David went to go face Goliath, when you're holding, if he had had a sword, he could maintain control. And you see, religion will allow us, that's why we love it so much, because we get a little bit of control with religion. So when you're holding a sword, it's in your hands. It's, it's under your control. With your brute strength, you are you're causing that sword to cut. But you see, with a stone and a sling, as soon as that stone leaves the sling, you have no control where that thing is going to go, right? I mean, you can try your best. You can aim, and I'm sure he was aiming for Goliath, but as soon as that stone left the sling, it was out of his hands. It was all God from there. And so God is taking us out of this uh, mindset, this confusing mindset of religion and all of its scaffolding because he wants to free his people. He wants to free them to trust him because he can keep that stone going straight ahead in the right position. Amen? Number three. The third nation is Palestine. Now we hear that word a lot lately. Palestine. The word means wandering, sojourners. A people who wander. That's what Palestine means. That's what the original language tells us. And so the third mindset, the third nation, the third assumption, let's say, in this journey that we're on is that I can't find people to be safe with. I cannot find people that I trust. I cannot find people that I love. Therefore, I got to do this alone and I got to keep moving. I got to be a wandering soul. <laughs> a vagabond, exactly. Some old English there. And so, 1 Corinthians 12, 12 tells us another story. It tells us that we are born into a body. It says, for as the body is one and has many members, but all of the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member but many. And so we can, if we really can understand that and embrace that, then I believe that we're going to start to let other people into our lives. We're going to say, okay, I have, I have been let down by people my whole life, but I don't have to stay there. I am now born into the body of Christ. And these people love me no matter what. No matter if they smile at me when I come in the door or maybe they just stepped on a nail or something and they, they kind of got a weird face. That's okay. There's love. Did you know that love, it, it supersedes everything. It, it supersedes looks on the face, uh, greetings, everything. And so it's, uh, it's something we need to understand. We don't need to keep moving. We don't need to keep looking for the people. What if God has placed us sovereignly right here with this church, with this people? Yes, there is one body of Christ. There is, there is one baptism. But there are specific expressions of the family of God in specific towns, cities, nations, and neighborhoods. So what if God is saying to you and to me, I've placed you in a place where you can be safe. You don't need to keep wandering. You don't need to feel alone. You are in a many-membered body. Stop assuming the other mindset. 
All right, number four. The other nation is the Mediterranean nations. They're just kind of all grouped together. Now, the Mediterranean nations were known for the rocky shores. So if you think about the Mediterranean, there's just the, the shores are rocky. So the, the original word in the original language there in the Hebrew means the rock, something that's strong. That is a nation that needs to go from resisting God to displaying his glory. And so the mindset there is I have to be strong. I, I've got to do this. I've got to be strong. Especially once you realize the holiness of God and, and the standard that is set before us. And we understand that, that there is this walk that we're on. That we want to continue to grow in Christ. And so one of the mindsets we've got to leave behind is this mindset that I've got to be strong. And 2 Corinthians 12, 9 is clear. Of course, this is the Apostle Paul dealing with the, what he was dealing with in his life. And it says, and he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So his strength is made perfect in my weakness. And so this idea, this mindset, this assumption that I've got to be strong has got to go. In fact, we should, we should endeavor to be as weak in our own natural strength as possible so that he can then be strong through us. You see, but we have this mindset that I've got to be the rock. The Mediterranean nation, I've got to be strong. But I'm not called to be the rock. The rock is Jesus Christ. He is who is strong. And if I build my house upon that rock, when the winds and the waves and the floods come, it will not be moved. Now, me being the oldest of eight siblings, I can identify with this one. Because as the oldest sibling, you want to be strong for the rest of the family. Anybody know what I'm saying? Any other old, oldest siblings here? Any? Okay. So you want to be strong. So you, you go through life and you begin to develop a part of your personality that wants to be the one people can count on. But we have to be very, very careful in mixing the gospel with that idea. Just because that's our experience, just because, and it may be true that, you know, it is better when the oldest in a family is strong for the family. But we can't mix that with the gospel. The gospel is, is that I am utterly weak and I need Jesus Christ in my life. And it's okay to show that weakness sometime. And I think, again, God's bringing the body of Christ into a, a whole new reality, a whole new, let's say, openness. Many of us were born in a generation that said, real men don't cry. Anybody else? But God's bringing us out of all that stuff. I don't have to be the rock. Jesus Christ is the rock. And number five, the last nation on this journey that we are on is called distant Ethiopia. Distant Ethiopia. Now, if you think about Ethiopia... Those were the descendants of Ham. And they were a people, if you remember, um, Noah had a little too much wine to drink. And he had a little situation. Uh, he was exposed in his nakedness. And the other two brothers, was it two or three? Uh, I don't remember. But Ham looked upon his father's nakedness. It's, it's showing us something about shame about um, reveling in other people's weakness and so his descendants were cursed and so the mindset number five that I need to deal with is this idea that I am under the curse that I am under a curse somehow that I am rejected in some way because of something I did or something my forefathers did. We need to understand that we are not under the curse. 
You ever hear somebody say, well, that just, that just always happens to me. I don't know, you know, it always, problems always seem to come to me. That's the curse. We don't have to confess that stuff. We can confess the glory of God and the positivity of where we are in the Spirit. And so Galatians 3.10 tells us some really good information on this. This curse that we think we're under sometime. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. You see, the law and religion put us under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. For the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. And here it is. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And so it's through faith that we understand that we are not under the curse. We are, the curse is behind us. That is a mindset we need to leave behind us. And sometimes it can be just, just a, a subtle thought that the enemy puts in our head when something happens to us, something bad happens or some consequence and we say, here it is again. I'm back in the same, I'm, I'm back on the same treadmill here. We don't have to accept it. We can take those thoughts and cast them out. We can take that nation and make it bow down to Jesus Christ because he became a curse for us so that we could come out of the curse. All right, let's go ahead and close with a few more verses of Psalms 87. This is just preceding or just after where we started. Verse 5, but over Zion it will be said, so this is after these nations glorify him, the mighty man was born there and he will establish it. For the God most high will truly bless Jerusalem, which of course is the city of peace. And when, her counts, when he counts her citizens, recording them in his registry, he will write by their names. This one was born again here, Selah. And the princes of God's feasts will sing and dance, singing every fountain of delight springs up from your life within me. And so the nations that once resisted God, the mindsets that we once had, have been converted and now glorify God. And it says here, every fount of delight springs up from your life within me. Are we ready for a new level of joy in the body of Christ? I sure hope so. I, I don't want to go to church with a bunch of people that always just seem angry, upset, sad. I mean, there's times for sadness, but come on. The joy of the Lord is our strength. That is where we get our strength. And the Bible says weeping may endure for a night. And so joy comes in the morning. So there is a season where, yes, we examine ourselves. There are times where we put sackcloth and ashes. There are times. But we cannot live there. We cannot stay there. Because God wants us to have strength. And so those nations that once resisted can glorify His name. We can put His glory on display in this earth. This is a message, and I've said it before, it's so much bigger than just living a nominal Christian life, doing the best you can until you go to heaven. Because that doesn't do what this verse is talking about. That does not put the glory of God on display. We want His glory in the earth. And if He calls some of us on to heaven, that's okay. It's a beautiful place. But when Jesus said, I go to prepare a, a mansion, a dwelling place, that where I am, you may be also. Yes, he was talking about heaven, but he's also talking about a realm he was living in while he walked this earth. He said, I want you to be where I am, in such a place of peace, such a place of sonship that I am. That's what Jesus did. 
He was putting God's glory on display. When you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And he taught us so much. Amen. Amen. A pure expression of the nature of the Father. But see, God is changing some of the way I see these things because I saw that the Father God, he was kind of like the bad cop and Jesus was the good cop. And so the Father always was kind of a little bit mad at me and then Jesus was standing in the between saying, hey, listen, don't be mad at him. I died for him. And that's, these are the concepts we have. But then I realized, wait a minute, Jesus was an expression of the Father. So when we saw him, when we saw him talking to the woman at the well, to a woman that no one else would talk to, it baffled the disciples. Why are you even talking to this Samaritan woman? When we saw that, we were seeing the Father. We were seeing his true heart. And yes, when you read through the Old Testament, you see some very strong language and you see where God is trying to deal with a nation that never was before and get them to understand this thing. And so there are times of war. There are times of defeating the enemy. But there's also a time of peace and rest. Amen. There's also a time where we trade in our spear for the scepter and we sit on the throne seated in Christ, seated in heavenly places. And so I'm just encouraged, glad all you are here, and I appreciate your time. Amen. Anybody have any comments? Oh, we got one in the back. I'm actually really happy that you uh, mentioned about the uh, waves and the rock. Um, I've had a personal experience where I was over at a hospital once, and I actually had, um, I was flipping through channels, something called like the EEJV or something like the Evangelical Network or something like that. But they had this VHS that was playing, and it showed this huge hurricane uh, coming in and absolutely decimating a beach. Um, and the thing is, is the man had his stuff on the shore, and all the sand and all the house that he worked so hard to build himself got washed away because just out into the water, nowhere to be seen ever again. So he built it again, thinking that he was going to get a different result. I'll just build it on the sand again. And sure enough, another sand or another storm came by and washed that away as well. And the guy was getting more and more upset. Finally, he says, you know what, whatever. I'm just going to put it on this rock up here. Just like, why not? And when he did that, he realized that he was out of supplies because he was doing it all himself. So he got the supplies from another friend, which that's, I guess, the thing where God provided. And then he built his house up on the rock. The storm came and it washed away the whole beach again, but it did not wash away his house that was up on the rock. So I'm really glad that you uh, mentioned that. Yeah, the problem with relying on our own strength is that when we can't be strong anymore, we fall apart. And so God knows this. And so he says, I'm going to carry you uh, when you can't carry yourself. And I think we've all seen that. And he allows us to spend every bit of our natural strength to a point where we finally surrender and say, okay, I can't do this. And that's when he does it. Praise God. Um, just kind of correlate to it, what we're talking about, but it's would where where our our strength we're to do our part what we can, and but then He makes up the difference. Um, this was the day before Christmas. My vehicle broke down in Fort Lauderdale, and it was in the middle of the street with traffic flying by. I opened the door. You're almost taking the door off. And I needed some help right now. And I, my prayer was, Lord, I have angels. I need help. Get this truck off the street now. Help me. And, and send somebody to help me to, to, to do it. Well, 
my truck is a big truck, and even on a flat surface, I could probably barely push it myself. But I had it, but right there was a gas station, but it was going up an incline. Plus, I had to make a, a hard right. And I said the prayer. I said the prayer, and I got out, and I'm trying to turn the wheel, and it's just turning kind of easy, you know. It's not, I'm not struggling. I'm not wrestling it. And I start. And as soon as I leaned on the vehicle to move it, it starts rolling. And I'm just thinking somebody on the sidewalk, two or three people were helping me push it up. I went up the up the incline, and I got to the top. I turned around to thank them. Nobody was there. Nobody was there but but God. And then two more, and then I seen a little better place where I d needed to move the vehicle a little further. And, um, and, and two people at the gas station just pulled in, hopped out, and another person walking down the road, they helped me move my truck another few feet. And, and I probably could have done that myself, but God sent help immediately. He sent people in cars walking up, the angel, whatever. But I know that God was there. And I laid my hand on the dashboard, I said, Lord, this is Christmas Eve, and I said, I need this truck. I got about six blocks to get to my family's house. And I said, um, and God just said, I gave man wisdom to make cell phones and computers in this truck. He goes, you don't think I know what's wrong with it? I mean, just, just like, I said, well, good. So let's get it to the house and show me how to fix it, which, which he did all that. And the truck wouldn't start. It wouldn't come on. It wouldn't come on. And I had called for my daughter to come. And as, as I'm seeing her come up to the turning lane, I try to truck again. It, it starts up into a safety mode, but I won't go very fast. And my daughter was on the phone. I said, I said, darling, just follow Dad. I'm going to pull out of the gas station. Show me how to get through the back streets and get me to the parking spot, you know. And I pulled up. She pulled up right behind me. She told me, Dad, turn, stop sign, turn here, turn there. And... I got there, I just went in the house. I said, God just gave me peace. He said, don't worry about it. This is the day before Christmas. And then after I relaxed, he goes, well, there's a call before it gets too late to get the peace you need. And the one place was 0.4 miles away from where I was. The only place was open. I got to part. I got back. I just threw it in the truck. And the next morning, I just went in. I, I'm not even concerned about it. God just gave me peace. I got up on Christmas morning. We had our Christmas for a while. And about noontime, he said, go put the part on. And I'm praying, and everything just came apart. And the last thing about this was I cleaned my truck out. I didn't have a single tool inside but one wrench. And it was a 10-millimeter deep well socket with a ratchet. It was the ex only tool that I needed. And, and my ex-wife had a screwdriver that I borrowed. And it, it just all went together, snapped together like Lego blocks. The engine light came off. The thing's running better than it did before when it was running right. And I, I felt no harm from it. But I know 100% that it was beyond my ability, beyond my wisdom, beyond my strength. And as soon as, but all I had to do is believe them. And when I started touching the steering wheel, it just turned easy. When I started pushing the truck, people showed up and it moved out of the way. When I got the piece, Wisdom showed me how to put it together, and I came back and I saved gas mileage and and you know and all kinds of stuff. But I just know that's just how God is. You know when Jesus said, "Take my yoke upon you," for my yoke is easy and burden is light. He was talking about a type of yoke that two oxen would actually be uh, secured in not one but two and so he's there and then you come alongside him and then when he when you cannot go another inch because you have no strength then he carries so the stronger oxen carries the other one and so he will carry us and um, he's not here to put heavy burdens on us he's not here to put religion on us He's here to just release us into our destiny to glorify God in the earth. Amen. All right. Amen. Always gives us a testimony. Well, let's just pray. Lord Jesus, we just thank you for speaking. Father, we ask that you help us to be comfortable in weakness so that you can be strong in our life. We ask that you just change assumptions 
change ideas that we might have that don't line up with yours. And we ask that we could be an expression of your life and your glory in this earth. Please help us to get out of the way so that can happen. In Jesus' name, amen.